In 2010, Lauren Faust was asked by Hasbro executives if she wanted to pitch a new program based on My Little Pony, a then 27-year-old intellectual property that Hasbro was looking to revitalize following the success of the 2007 Transformers film. Lauren agreed and took the next six weeks to design her pitch for the show that would eventually become Friendship is Magic. The company had some notes about what the show could and couldn't have, but during the pitch phase, Lauren was given largely free reign to pitch a program that children would find engaging while also improving on issues she had with girl shows growing up. Chief among these was a rule regarding what I'm gonna call the lovey-dovey stuff. I spent the last two weeks scouring the internet for a blurb, a quote from the horse's mouth, anything to nail down exactly what this rule entails, but I've come to realize that this direction was less of a commandment and more of a rule of thumb. I'll break it down for you, but I also want to discuss why this trend started, the sort of problems it solves, and show you how even the best rules are made to be broken. There's a lot of hearsay about what exactly Lauren had in mind regarding the lovey-dovey stuff, and I still haven't found a concrete source that quotes Lauren on the matter, but generally speaking, it was Lauren's request that none of the main six cast members get involved in romantic relationships, because it's something she felt bogged down the shows she watched growing up as a child of the 70s and 80s. And I can accept that. Relationships are already hard to write for adults, and these problems only get worse when you write for a younger audience. Problem number one. A couple is still made up of two individuals. A character knows who they are as an individual better than anyone else, but when they get together with someone, both parties agree that on some level, part of your focus is always going to be on the relationship. Instead of two separate characters, you now have two separate characters and a relationship dynamic. I love my wife to death, but when we got married, I accepted someone obsessed with Egyptology and Disney kitsch, and she received a film snob with an obsession for ponies and Dutch reality television. It's possible to flesh out both sides of a character in a functioning relationship, but doing it well takes time the show just doesn't have. This is a show with almost 500 characters, and a Simpsons-level cast does not lend itself well to developing a three-dimensional character with a functioning three-dimensional relationship. It says a lot that the most notable couple in Friendship is Magic is relatively flatly written in exchange for being literally everything I could ever want out of a relationship. Problem number two, will they, won't they, isn't usually a good source of tension. Within the realm of children's shows, girl characters, and boy characters for that matter, can be complex characters with multiple life goals, and there's nothing wrong with finding that special sum pony being one of those goals. Rarity is the most career-oriented character in the entire show, and there was still a gag about her catching the bouquet at the wedding in season two. But like point number one, addressing a character's personal and relationship goals takes time and effort, and it can be really tempting as a creator to shortcut a character to just a woman who wants to get married. And that's really boring. Think back to Best Night Ever, when Rarity spent the entire episode trying to get with Prince Blue Blood. Was that really the most interesting part of that episode? There was a neat subversion with Blue Blood being a stuck-up jerk to show that getting yourself a man isn't the only worthwhile pursuit, but the courtship subplot got outshined by almost everything else in that episode. Which leads me to problem three. Not everyone is into that. I remember being 10 years old and coming home from middle school every day to watch the latest rerun of this new show called Totally Spies, about three high school girls who moonlight as secret agents in skin-tight bodysuits. I didn't really care that the show was about high school girls, because I was 10, but there was more than enough action in the spy plot that I still really enjoyed the show. Problem is, when Sam, Clover, and Alex weren't saving the world as part of a secret spy organization, they were doing normal high school girl stuff. And according to this show, high school girls talk almost exclusively about high school boys. As a kid who really wanted to like this terrifically weird show, I found almost every B-plot incredibly boring. I understand the intended demographic for that show was elementary and middle school girls, but as a 10-year-old boy, the heavy focus on relationship elements is what kept me from revisiting the show as an adult. Lauren Faust wrote a now-famous rebuttal for Miss Magazine to a hilariously poorly researched critique of Friendship is Magic, where she elaborated on some of the writing philosophy behind crafting girl characters on the show she worked on. I try to bring sincerity and depth to the female characters I've animated and have fought in development and story meetings to make female characters more than just the typical girlfriend, mom, or sex symbol. Having seen the fruits of her labor a decade later, I can understand how much of a worthwhile pursuit it was to strive for depth and focus when it comes to women and girls in cartoons. I could count on one hand the number of times that Friendship is Magic strayed from this core philosophy, and I think it did the show only favors. But the coolest thing about those times when the show breaks its own rule and dabbles in romance is that I don't think most of those moments were mistakes. Part of implementing rules in a creative process is knowing when those 
those rules should be broken, and most of the series' slip-ups were either inconsequential or made to service a larger point. The only time the lovey-dovey rule was broken that I think could be argued didn't pay off was in simple ways, when Rarity gets so obscenely thirsty for Trenderhoof, the fashion writer, that the entire episode becomes one long humiliation conga for the one character that doesn't really do bad episodes. Yeah, the Aesop of the episode is that it's not good to change yourself to impress someone else, but it comes at the expense of Rarity catching up on four seasons of not having egg on her face. This kind of plot was done much better in Best Night Ever when she swoons after Prince Blue Blood, who turns out to be a total ass. That entire episode was about having unrealistic expectations, so at least the encounter was on theme. Pretty much any other time that two characters in Equestria got together, the show tried to avoid breaking the lovey-dovey rule by picking couples out of one of four categories. First, you have the periphery couples, where most of their identity is already drawn from the quality of being in a relationship. Shining Armor and Cadence, Mr. and Mrs. Cake, Cranky and Matilda. Then you've got the story couples, where two characters get together to service the plot of the episode itself. This is where you'll find some of my favorites and some absolutely banger episodes. Big Mac and Sugar Bell, Bright Mac and Pear Butter, even Quibble Pants and his new girlfriend Clear Sky deliver really awesome stories despite being guest characters. Then you have the finished characters, the ones with already completed character arcs that are a little harder to derail with a significant other since their personal journey is already basically complete. The one that comes to mind is Maude only getting together with Mudbriar after getting her Rockdorit degree and moving out on her own, but you could also apply this to Lyrabon, Cheese Pie, Apple Dash, or any of the 11th hour couples from the finale, regardless of how much or little run-up time they had in the show proper. The fourth category is mostly a catch-all for fanships that are still fun, but don't have any real certified evidence in the show to back up a romantic relationship. These are your Flutter Chords, your Star Bursts, your Star Trixes, basically anyone with a functioning play platonic relationship that can be fun to extrapolate into your own little headcanon or fanfiction. These are the fun ones to talk about because it's mostly harmless and it's always fun to odd couple your two favorites together. At the end of the day, I don't think the lovey-dovey rule should be taken so seriously that it hampers your enjoyment of the show. It's a flexible tool with a lot of malleability, but it shouldn't be taken as gospel 100% of the time. I mean, the franchise pretty much threw the whole rule out the window when they made Equestria Girls, so the production team at least knew there was a time and a place for everything. Even if that meant sicking a mob of angry fans on Flash Sentry. But that's my severely late Valentine's Day episode. I had a lot more I wanted to squeeze into this episode that wouldn't quite fit, like how Scootaloo's Aunt Holiday and Auntie Lofty are such an effective LGBT representation because they were written like normal characters. I also wanted to tackle Yona and Sandbar, but that's a hill I'm gonna have to die on some other day. 